questions, and we will try to go through all of them. Um, we know that time is limited, but we'll do our best. Um, that way we can get everyone's questions um, collected, and we can present them to the speaker and the moderator. Okay, thank you. To open the evening session, I'd like to introduce to you our second post-plenary post roundtable moderator, Professor Sean Lowen. Dr. Lowen is Associate Professor in the Second Language Studies and MA TESOL programs at Michigan State University. In addition to publishing and leading SLA journals, he has authored several books including Introduction to Instructed Second Language Acquisition, which appeared in 2015. He is also the co-editor of the Routledge Handbook of Instructed Second Language Acquisition, coming in spring 2017. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Professor Sean Nolan. begin my um, introduction with a disclaimer. I didn't get the email that said we were supposed to come up with um, metaphors for our introductions, <laughs> so I don't have any equivalent image of Uncle Rod in his Bermuda shorts for you for um, Roy, so apologies. But it is my distinct privilege to introduce to you um, our speaker for this, this afternoon, um, Dr. Roy Lister, who is a professor in the Department of Integrated Studies in Education at McGill University in Montreal. Um, Roy will be very familiar to most of us in the room, and we don't need an introduction to his research because of the substantial impact that his work has had uh, in the field of se instructed second language acquisition over the past three decades. Roy's research interests include oral corrective feedback and content-based language instruction. In terms of corrective feedback, his work goes back to the mid-1990s with his well-known uh, pair of articles in 1998, as well as the seminal publication um, Lister and Ranta in 1997, which, according to Google Scholar, has been cited more than 2,000 times. Um, since then, he has continued with an impressive number of empirical studies, um, in, as well as um, some research syntheses and meta-analysis, including um, Lister and Saito 2010, and Lister, Saito, and Sato 2013. In regards to content-based language instruction, Roy has also been active in that field. Um, he has a book in 2007, which was titled Learning and Teaching Languages Through Content. And just this year, he's had a book appear in French on language, immer on language immersion. And I won't inflict my French pronunciation on you, but the title of it is listed in his bio in the program. <laughs> So, um, despite his prolific um, research and high quality research, um, Roy is no ivory tower academician. He, in addition to his um, in focus on researching in the classroom, he's also very concerned with engaging teachers, uh, with uh, talking about research and the implications of that in the classroom. And also, on, I looked at his CV online, and he's uh, cites more than 40 professional development workshops that he's given since 2010, which averages out to about one every two months. So he's been very busy in that regard. And um, so I think that Roy is very qualified to talk to us today about the topic of making research on ISLA relevant for teacher practices. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Roy Lister. Wow, <laughs> that was a very nice introduction and a real honor to be introduced by Sean Lowen. He's, he's a colleague I hold in very high esteem, so thank you. And thank you very much to the organizers. You've done an incredible job. Uh, we might, after the first day, might want to give the organizers a round of applause. To get started. <laughs> I was actually asked uh, when I was invited more than a year ago to 
to give a talk on corrective feedback. And I thought, oh, maybe we kind of know that story. Maybe I should try to tell a different one. Um, but I have tried to integrate a focus um, on corrective feedback into my talk. And what I've decided to do is to talk about some of the work that I've been doing over the past 15 years with teachers trying to bring um, trying to bring SLA research or second language education research uh, closer to their classrooms <clears throat> and I've been doing some classroom based studies and most of my research has been done uh, at the school level so I'm going to talk about school based education and the importance of integrating language and content I know that in the field of SLA and in ISLA, we, we talk a lot about form and meaning. And instead of focusing on form and meaning, I'm going to talk about language and content, and very specifically about school-based programs that involve, uh, there's a set of acronyms here, it's hard to keep up with the acronyms, but there's CBI, Content-Based Instruction, CBLT, Content-Based Language Teaching, CLIL, which is Content and Language Integrated Learning, and of course in the Canadian context, for years we've been calling our programs immersion programs, and I think all of the studies I'll be reporting on take place in the Canadian context of French immersion. <clears throat> I'm going to talk about the importance of integrating language and content, and I'm going to go through three different research projects that I've done, and I'll start with one uh, from 2004. It's a little bit dated, but it's the, uh, the corrective feedback study I did that was an intervention study comparing different types of feedback. But I want to present it as um, a form-focused instruction study with a certain instructional sequence that I've been using ever since uh, with the teachers that I worked with. And then I'm going to <clears throat> move away from a researcher-designed um, treatment to teacher-designed instructional treatment so that I've been working with teacher. What, what we often do in ISLA is um, researchers design interventions and we implement them. And what I've been trying to do is train teachers how to design interventions that they then implement and we videotape them and analyze their, their, both their planning and their implementation. And I'll be talking about two different studies, one that's ongoing and one that's completed. <clears throat> So I'll start, um, I, I do a lot of conferences that are about content-based language teaching, so I'm not uh, sure how familiar everyone is with some of these issues, but these are issues that Meryl Swain raised back in the 1980s when she proposed her uh, output uh, hypothesis, the importance of trying to integrate language and content. And Patsy Lightbound has an interesting book, a fairly recent book called uh, Content-Based Language Teaching, <clears throat> in which she points out that the separation of content and language in an academic program is thought to deprive students of opportunities to focus on specific features of language at the very moment when their motivation to learn them may be at its highest. <clears throat> and this sums up quite nicely what uh, Rod Ellis was saying this morning about focus on form and how Michael, uh, the way Michael Long operationalized focus on form. It's this idea of drawing attention to language when it's really being used by students. <clears throat> what we know, though, uh, from years of research in the uh, Canadian immersion context is that teachers really tend to separate language and content. Uh, they do a class on uh, French language arts, and there's no connection to content, and then they do their teaching of mathematics and social studies and make very little reference to language or make very little reference back to the French language arts class. <clears throat> and what we also know from recent research in, in the United States is that teachers really do, this is what teachers say is their greatest challenge, is how to integrate language and content. It's so easy for us to tell teachers, remember to you know, teach grammar communicatively, and remember to integrate language and content, but really what they need are strategies of really how to do this. What does that procedure look like? And Camerata and Tedek in their recent paper and others always point to the fact that teachers need a great deal of professional development to do this, they need a great deal of training to do this. Um, it doesn't just happen. <clears throat> so <clears throat> we need to ask why, that, why it's important, why, why can't we just separate language and content, why is it important to integrate them 
And here I do refer back uh, again to Meryl Swain's work from, uh, from the 80s, uh, which I find, I find very interesting. It points out the ex how limited actually teacher discourse is in terms of the range of functions and forms that it contains. And one of the best examples is uh, the, 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 the range of verb tenses used by uh, French immersion teachers, for example. Uh, I actually repl replicated their study in, 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 in Montreal, and in both cases we found that teachers used the present tense or the imperative about 75% of the time, and the past tense about 15% of the time. And uh, this was very eye-opening to us, because we always talk about rich exposure to rich input in the classroom, <laughs> and yet when you start looking at it from a discourse perspective and a grammatical perspective, uh, it has certain limitations, <clears throat> and in fact, later what I'm going to do, Meryl Swain has a very nice example mm -hmm. of a history lesson that's actually taught uh, as in, partly in the present tense and also in the immediate future tense. And some of my work with teachers has been about trying to get them to teach history using past tense verbs, and I'll come back to that later. Uh, <clears throat> The other thing that Swain said, and many, many others have said, of course, is that we can understand a discourse without precise syntactic uh, and morphological knowledge. In other words, learners can bypass grammar and still understand the content. And this was very important for us to understand in the, in the uh, immersion context. We really thought that through exposure, uh, students would be picking up the grammar. And what we do know is that they pick up an awful lot but there's a lot of language that they don't pick up that needs some sort of attention. <clears throat> and I'll come back to that later to refer it again, uh, to refer again to Raj's talk. It's not so much about uh, ex you know, teaching these features explicitly in traditional grammar lessons, but it's finding ways of integrating a focus on language in, uh, into the content instruction. So, <clears throat> If we know that learners, that classroom discourse is limited in terms of forms and functions, and if we know that students can actually process language, or sorry, process the content and understand meaning without necessarily processing uh, the grammar of the language, then we need to um, do something. And one of the proposals that has been made uh, for years has been trying to make stronger connections between what students are exposed to in content classes and what and 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 uh, what they are exposed to in terms of language. So, <clears throat> the way I've been talking about this since my 2007 uh, book was, has simply been in terms of counterbalance, and counterbalance is just a way of talking about integrating language and content. And the reason I like this term, I like the term counterbalance, is because it's different from, uh, it doesn't mean that we're balancing language and content. That would mean that the focus is, is, uh, is equal, but really the focus is variable. But what it means is that if you're in a class that is really content-based and there's very little focus on language, the learners will benefit uh, by a greater focus on language. But it also means that if a student is in a more traditional classroom and the focus is very much on language or on forms, uh, then those learners will benefit from a much more meaningful focus. And I ad tend to advocate um, bringing in content into those classes. Um, <clears throat> so the reason that I continue to use this term, at least with the teachers I work with, is that for me, counterbalance covers all contexts. So that Rod Ellis this morning was talking about um, the extent to which focus on form is relevant for all contexts. And in my experience, too, focus on form or form-focused instruction uh, is, is very hard to operationalize in traditional contexts in some, you know, Japanese EFL classrooms, for example. Whereas counterbalance um, can apply across all contexts in the sense that if there is a strong focus on language, teachers need to bring in uh, some content. And so when I do work in uh, other contexts where the, the focus is very much already on form, then I encourage teachers and show them ways of bringing content into their lessons. So con counterbalance instruction, uh, this is what I relate to language across the curriculum. This is a big thing in schools and yet still very hard to apply. Language across the curriculum really means that 
uh, language teaching is every single teacher's responsibility and not just the, the language teacher. And it's also about shifting students' attention uh, from content to language. So that often what teachers do is they think that they're just going to focus on language or they're just going to focus on content because they don't really want to confuse students. But, um, <clears throat> well, I was being facetious. I always say, yes, confuse them, but that's not really what I want to say. Uh, <laughs> but that this idea of shifting attention from language to content can be actually very effective uh, in the way that it can strengthen connections in memory and sort of increase depth of processing. Okay, when you're, when you're put in a situation where you have to reflect on more than one thing at the same time. And I'll try to come back to that in the examples that I'm going to give. And I also talk, uh, I break this approach down into proactive and reactive approaches. These are terms that um, uh, Rod Ellis used in his talk and uh, terms that were used um, in, the, um, in the Focus on Form book from 1998, uh, Doughty and Williams. <coughs> so for me, these, it's, imp it's important to, these terms become important for me when I work with teachers. Uh, so that, on the one hand, we talk about a reactive approach, which appears to be somewhat spontaneous. It involves interaction with learners, and it very much draws on the interaction hypothesis and the fact that oral interaction is really a key source of second language learning. And the way that I talk about it is very much, in, it's more in terms of scaffolding, um, but um, very much about good questioning techniques and also corrective feedback. I'm going to talk a bit more about the proactive approach here, um, where there's planning involved, and I'm going to go through the procedures or the different phases of planning that involve opportunities for noticing, awareness, and practice. But I just want to make the point that I see these as complementary and that you really can't do one without the other. So when I'm talking about the proactive approach, um, I would like to try to illustrate that the reactive approach still uh, permeates that approach. <clears throat> and I just want to make a quick reference to a set of studies that have been done in Canadian uh, French immersion classrooms uh, between 1989 and 2013. There's a set of seven quasi-experimental studies that really look at um, the integration of form-focused instruction into these immersion classrooms focusing on grammatical gender, verb tenses, and that the, the effects of these have been relatively positive, so that when you look at the 40 uh, post-tests, immediate and delayed post-tests that were given, students, um, made, students engaged in this instruction um, made sig significant improvement on 75% of these tests relative to students who were expected to pick up these linguistic items um, on their own from the regular curriculum. So there's a quick reference to these studies, and now I want to move into one of these studies, is, which is the study that I did in 2004 uh, that focused on grammatical gender with fifth grade learners. This was studied in, uh, published in SSLA. One of the reasons I want to focus on it is because it's, it's often referred to as a feedback study, but actually what we really, really worked hard on was the instruction, uh, the instructional sequence, and feedback was one part of that. Um, <clears throat> I also want to mention, uh, I, I really don't like drawing on any one particular theory. I think good, good education and good teaching draws on various theories, but I have found skill acquisition theory to be quite useful in some of the work that I'm doing, uh, especially with uh, corrective feedback. Um, and, and it's all about um, you know, proceduralizing declarative knowledge, because my work with teachers has shown me that schools often stop at declarative knowledge. They say, OK, they know the rule, now we can move on to something else. Whereas I see it much more, it's more about the practice. How do we really get students using the language in meaningful ways? Um, and what I also like about skill acquisition theory is that I think it's one of the only ones that really attributes a very explicit role to both feedback and practice, saying that this is what moves language development forward. It's the practice opportunities and the feedback. So you'll see in the, in the sequence that I'm going to show you uh, 
this, this model will, will be quite apparent. <clears throat> so, the, um, I, love, I love this title of this article. It's called The Power of Feedback. And it, it's, not a, it's an article from general educational psychology. It's not, it's not actually from SLA. Um, <clears throat> but before I get to that, I just want to mention that the tricky part about feedback is that many of us believe that it's most effective uh, it's most effective to provide feedback when students really have something to say. Uh, so we have to give feedback in the heat of the moment. Uh, in Rod's talk, he mentioned that this is still an empirical question, and I agree, there's still lots of work to be done on the effects of delayed feedback. Um, for the time being, I have a tendency to encourage teachers to, to develop skills so that they're doing it during the interactional moment. Um, another thing I find important, and this comes from the Hattie and Timpoli um, article and also from <coughs> some debates that have been going on, uh, sometimes corrective feedback, I think, in ISLA or SLA is kind of seen as separate from the rest of the instruction. And I've been actually criticized for, for, for integrating it into the instruction. So I want to stand here and make a plea for integrating corrective feedback into instruction rather than seeing it something that, that's not part of instruction. And um, I like these quotes from Hattie and Temporally, feedback can only build on something that's of little use when there's no initial learning or surface information. <clears throat> uh, and the idea here is that teachers really need to work hard to design contexts of practice where feedback can be given meaningfully. So I'm going to give you an example of the study from 2004. So it was a exper quasi-experimental study. In terms of the form-focused instruction, there was also a control or comparison group that had none of the instruction. And then with the experimental groups, um, there were three different groups. One either had recasts or prompts or no corrective feedback. And these were fifth grade students. <coughs> and <coughs> this is what, what I want, this is what I've been focusing on with teachers, like how to, how to have a content objective and a language objective at the same time. So in the example that I'm going to give you, the content focus is from a history lesson focusing on the difficulties and challenges of life in New France in 17th century. Okay? And at the same time, the language focus is on grammatical gender and very specifically on um, uh, noun endings, reliable noun endings that help learners predict grammatical gender. Okay? So it has a dual focus. And to start with, in the, the noticing phase, it's really, it would be better named as a contextualization phase. The whole point is that you start with the context. You start with the content. You don't start with the language. So in this particular case, and I, I just want to reiterate that I'm just giving you small samples of long, long sequences, uh, just to give you an idea of the overall uh, uh, sequence. So this is a, this is a, a text about New France, and it's a typical text at the fifth grade level that students would be reading and focusing on some of the difficulties um, that these pioneers were experiencing during their time of fur trade. They were starving from scurvy. Uh, there was a lack of food and so on. And then at one point, once they've elaborated on the content, uh, they move into this awareness phase where certain target words have been highlighted, so this is the typographical enhancement. And so words like, these are really key words, like établissement, the whole point is to establish a colony. And they're also talking about défrichement, which is about the clearing of the forest. And the point, sorry, clearing of the forests. And the point here is for students to start to notice that some of these noun endings that are similar indicate the same gender. So M-E-N-T is, is, is a masculine ending. Um, other key words here have to do with la fourrure, which is fur, uh, which was a big part of the economy, of course, and also la nourriture, which is food, which was lacking and causing scurvy. And the point is for students to start to notice um, these patterns in the language. So it's really about pattern detection. Um, and then in, in the real, once they've moved into the awareness phase, they're really working together to try to classify uh, different nouns according to their endings and whether or not they are masculine or feminine. 
So they will have noticed that the M-E-N-T words are masculine and the U-R-E words are feminine. And, and this, again, as I mentioned earlier, this is where some teachers will stop. They'll say, good, they, just, they detected the rules. Now we can move on. But the whole point is, what, what, how do we proceduralize this now? They have the declarative knowledge. How do we move on and how do we create opportunities for practice and also feedback? So <clears throat> what I'm giving you is a very, very condensed version. I'm just giving you one example. But we created hundreds of riddles that were used to review the history content. Um, but that at the same time elicited very specific target words. So in this example, and of course everything's done in French, but in this example the riddle is, I am, I am what covers certain mammals and I can be made into warm coats. Mm -hmm. So we're eliciting the word... <laughs> la, fourrure. <laughs> la fourrure. And this, this gives an opportunity to the teacher, so, so the focus is on both content. We want them to know that conceptually uh, this is fur, uh, but we also want them to indicate the right gender, and it provides the teacher with a very focused opportunity to provide feedback. So <clears throat> this was ongoing, this type of exercise. Um, what's important, and I feel I'm really condensing this, but. <laughs> Uh, what's important is to move on, though, so that we're not just playing linguistic games. We really need to come back to the content, right? And <clears throat> one of the objectives of the social studies programs is for students to make comparisons between past and present, <clears throat> and uh, to make comparisons in terms of social values. How have social values changed since then? Um, so here is an activity where students are asked either to um, uh, engage in a writing task or maybe an oral debate or oral discussion and they are asked to do the following compare the attitudes of people in New France with those of people today concerning the fashionability of fur so much of the history part was about the fur industry fur was very fashionable at the time given changes in social values and animal rights movements and so on, there's a different perception of the extent to which fur is a fashionable item and so on. And the point here is to try to get students to engage with the content objectives and discuss these issues. And uh, this is called autonomous practice, so the students are really supposed to be given uh, a, much, a much more freedom to express themselves, but at the same time, uh, the teachers have a very focused linguistic objective, and the bottom line is to make sure they're getting the gender of the word fur correct, okay? Again, I'm reducing this, but I just want to show you this as a sequence, and then uh, present this to you, <coughs> which is based to some extent on a model, it's an hourglass model that Pauline Gibbons has come up with to, to illustrate scaffolding and this idea of focusing in on language. So starting big with the content objectives, focusing in on life in New France and so on, but then taking the time and the text to focus in more on language through the awareness activities and then the guided practice, but then to come back to the content area. And so this is, this is what I've been doing with teachers when they say, what does that mean to integrate language and content? I always say, start with the content, zoom in, and remember to zoom back out and come back to the content. And so this is what, uh, the, the, so now I can say the name of the book. This is my, the, the book I wrote in French is actually for French immersion teachers, and it's very much following this uh, particular model. It's called Une approche vers une approche intégrée en immersion. So you'll see it's an integrated approach, right? And this is really what I've been calling in English a counterbalanced approach, but uh, I found out that the word for counterbalance in French doesn't sound very nice. <laughs> le le contrepoids. So uh, we're calling it an integrated approach. <clears throat> so in that particular study, what, I can, what we could say from it is that in terms of the form-focused instruction, all students receiving that instruction significantly uh, outperformed the students who were studying the same history material but had no focus, no form-focused instruction on grammatical gender. <clears throat> in terms of the actual feedback types, there were more significant effects for the prompts than for recast, but only on written measures, so this was much less than we had predicted thought that there would be also effects uh, in the oral production. 
So, but well, partly based on this, but based on other syntheses of the literature on corrective feedback, I like to come back to Lister and Ranta's original conclusion for which we seem to get quite criticized for. Uh, that, that's a study that was called a recast study. It wasn't a recast study. We were observing teachers and we found that they typically employed recast much more than any other types of feedback. And what we concluded was teachers might want to consider the whole range of techniques they have at their disposal rather than relying so extensively on recast. So I still maintain this particular uh, a conclusion with the idea that really vari probably variety in use of corrective feedback is more useful than focusing in on or using only one type, although it's clear to me that continued recasting of what students already know is probably not an effective strategy for uh, pushing their development forward. And similarly, continuing, continuously prompting students to produce what they cannot yet produce will be equally <laughs> ineffective. So it gives us some uh, guidelines about how to make decisions here. I also like Patsy Lightbound's work here about the, the importance of variety, about how it's very stimulating for learning, uh, increases depth and transferability of learning, and that practice that is always predictable is likely to be less effective and probably less noticeable as well. Okay? Uh, and I just want to conclude this part on corrective feedback by referring to a nice study um, that was done in an SLA course by Vasquez and Harvey, uh, where their students actually uh, read some of the literature on corrective feedback, and they had to videotape a group, one of uh, a member of the group who was teaching. They had to transcribe the data, reflect using journal entries, and this uh, was spread out over the whole course of a semester. And the teachers' views really changed. It really started, they really started out saying, yeah, feedback is probably very problematic due to affective issues because we know, we know students don't like feedback. Although if you read the literature, most of it is saying that students say they would really appreciate getting feedback. Uh, and their, their, their beliefs shifted after doing the analysis and reading some of the research, and they started to look at feedback more in terms of its effectiveness and feasibility. So I like to think that this is those 40 workshops that I've been doing for over the last few years has a lot to do with work like this with teachers. <coughs> So now I want to move on to a different area <coughs> that doesn't specifically involve feedback. It's really about integrating a language focus into a content area. In this case, it's social studies. And these are two groups of teachers that I've been working with over the last few years. And I'll explain the, the context to you. So really what this is about is professional development. and that's really what I want to share with you is the importance of bringing SLA or ISLA to teachers through professional development opportunities. Now, in this school board where I've been working, they do not, it's an English speaking school board in Quebec, but it does not have a French immersion program. So these teachers, they are teachers of French as a second language, but they've also been asked to teach social studies in French. <coughs> Now the purpose of the professional development was to work with them to give them strategies to make links between their French class and their social studies class, both of which are taught in French. It sounds so simple, and yet when I first um, <clears throat> came into this group, they were quite surprised. They actually thought they, they couldn't. They thought social studies was, was separate and that they couldn't do social studies in French and they shouldn't refer to French in social studies. Um, I had the consultant there, so he backed me up and he said, yes, you can do this and we want you to do this. But they were, and they were happy to do it, but they didn't know they could do it. So it shows you this language and content separation, how ingrained it can be in some schools. <clears throat> so this project has, uh, we're in our third year now, I've worked with two cohorts. Now the, the point here is that, so I work with the teachers they have day-long workshops where they're collaborating with one another, trying to follow that model 
that I showed you, developing noticing awareness and practice activities that they integrate across their French and their social studies class. And then we have a team that goes in and videotapes the, them as they are teaching these units, so that might take a week or two. And then I edit these videos, I cut out the bad parts, uh, I edit these videos and they come back and do like a retrospective or a stimulated recall session while they're watching these videos <clears throat> in order to um, discuss the success of their intervention and also the impact it's had on their own training. Okay? So I, I just want to stress this part because it's stressful for everybody to be, to be videotaped like that. But what I really want to say is how successful this has been. I've been doing this for several years now and that even though initially they're stressed out, once it's, and I don't make them sign anything until after they've seen everything. So if I show you videos of teachers, it's because I have permission to do that. Um, but they, they, they benefit so much from seeing themselves and seeing their colleagues in a similar situation, and they comment on one another and are very supportive of one another. So this is a big part of the, um, of the design. Okay, so. The, the, this is the model that I've been using, so I just want to go through it again, where, they're, where they're, 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 they're really pushed to start with the content, create a context in which students can ultimately notice some language features at the awareness phase, practice them during guided practice, and then come back to the content phase in autonomous practice. So I want to give you a t an example created by teachers, this is where I've kind of moved uh, in my professional development work is to get teachers to do this. So this group of teachers was working together at the fourth grade level, and their focus is on Jacques Cartier and his three expeditions to the New World, looking at cause and effect relationships and the series